Okay, welcome. And we should be recording. Yeah. Okay, welcome to uh, Tuesday, 627. I think I'm figuring out one note. And uh, I think now I'm going to start having all my lectures together. So this will be the day. This, I'll do a new page for each lecture. And I think what I've got is a lecture in a single section, which I'm now calling ME6710 lectures. That only matters to me, but at least I can have our previous lecture up. Uh, and if you want to direct your attention, I think you can maybe see me in that little thumbnail. I've got up here the uh, kind of our schedule for today. I'll run through it quickly. A few opening remarks, which we're doing right now. We're going to, uh, and that'll include talking a little bit about the homework and uh, a quick review of our previous notes. We're going to do then Euler's angular equations. We're going to talk about the inertia matrix. I have two examples that I want us to work today. Uh, here I have moment free dynamics. We'll do that on, this is so much fun. We'll do that when we're together on Thursday. Bring your book, bring something to throw in the air. Uh, well, it, as time permits, I want to open a little MATLAB and, and do a little MATLAB. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make sure we have at least 20 minutes of MATLAB toward the end, and then we'll end. That's the plans for today, if I can keep on that. That'll be our agenda. And let's, uh, uh, I've got your homework, so I'm going to return it. I'll, I'll plan on bringing those back to you on Thursday. I'll be on tomorrow travel, so it'll be a good day to just, I haven't gone through them yet to give you a little insight, but uh, I'll do them tomorrow. I'm going to be on travel, so I'll go through them tomorrow and bring them to you. If you've sent me, sent those in to me, follow up, and that's just fine. Um, better late than never is my policy, so go ahead and, you know, if you're, even if you're behind, that's fine. Just, just try to work and get those in to me. Uh, I will have those back to you on, my plan is having them back to you on Thursday. Now, the other word on homework is that I posted late, as I said, better late than never, late uh, on our class website. And Jason, I think, had asked about where I was placing a few things. So, or at least <laughs> he was asking about la my last mail. So to run through again, I realized I didn't put up the last week's recordings. Last week's recording, I put on the YouTube channel and I mailed you that, but I failed to put them here. So I need to try to get organized where I'm getting them in both spots if I can. Uh, the last recordings on the YouTube channel. I'll try to do the same today. What I was referring to with Jason was the notes that uh, we're going through right now are now contained here. I, I had the wrong link going. So now I've got the notes on our equations of motion, Newtonian dynamics. We will do that today. We'll do that Thursday. It, on our agenda, our syllabus, we wrap up Newton Euler, this Newton Euler equations of motion this week. So you can refer to them there. We may even have one more class filling over into those. So if you haven't gotten those notes and you want to use those, put those there, get those there. Dr. Canfield, can I ask a question? You know what? Sure, Tommy. I just realized I put those in the wrong spot, though. Go ahead. What is it? Okay. My question was, I printed those off, I guess, before you sent that email out saying you posted them. Yeah. Is that what you're about to say? Well, no. Well... I just realized I messed up because I actually had a fine set of notes there and I overwrote them. I meant to put them down here under Newtonian dynamics. Ah, I messed up. Well, okay. If you think you have the right thing, great. Uh, my mistake. These were meant to be... No, that's... that's not, okay. It's down in there. The Newtonian stuff is in there. Oh, well, oh, maybe I need to. Huh, where are you seeing them? In, it's in that link that you got your cursor, the, the equations of motion. And Newton dynamics. Where you've got to evaluate EOM and Newtonian dynamics. It's yeah, that's actually not the set. That's not the set I wanted. This is something we're going to follow on. Once you get the equations of motion, I had a little discussion about how we solve those, how we can solve those. Go so I've got this yeah, go to way through and you'll see, you'll see the notes that okay. I think you're looking for. Okay. Well, let me go keep going. Oh yeah, there they are. Yeah, there they are. I didn't realize they were stuck together. So, okay. I, I thought I had these pulled out separately. So yeah, Kevin, thanks. You're right. It was this lower set. I meant to have these broken into two, but this lower set here, 
is what we're doing right now. And then the upper set we'll come back to later and catch. Okay, well, let me try to clean that up a little more. But as Kevin pointed, if you printed these, you have the notes that we're going to be going through today. Down here in the Newtonian dynamics, that's where I meant to put that latter part. And I thought I'd fix that, and I guess I didn't. Okay, <laughs> Jason, that's what I was referring to, but now I realize I messed it up. So I don't know if that's useful or not. As Kevin said, all the notes are here. If you've printed out this set, you have everything we're talking about the rest of this week. And then finally, the homework. I've got the uh, solutions here to chapter one. Hopefully, do I have that homework? Hopefully, I have the, I'm going to assume I have the homework one solutions up. And here's the homework two, chapter two solutions. And then, okay. So let's talk about this. So I just got this up yesterday, a little late, but I've got the chapter three homeworks posted and I've got the chapter three practice posted with the solutions for the practice as well. In chapter three, I'm assigning problems one, five, and 10 for practice and three, oh, excuse me, that's chapter three, four, six, and 18 for homework. If you click on that link, hopefully it draws them out. I tried to just reproduce the homework right up, although probably not as well as what's in the book. In case you have an older edition of the book, make sure yours is matching. And then th here's some solutions. And, then, and the nice thing, this set of homework is gonna, is gonna look just like the practice. It should now, you should start feeling like you're practicing the stuff you're expecting to practice, okay? Uh, problems four and six are straightforward. They're important practice problems. So let's go ahead and plan on having at least those in if you can for Thursday. I know that's a little short notice, but work on those for Thursday or the end of the week. I'll happily take them, you know, later. But uh, if you want to give them to me in my hand, I'll be there, of course, Thursday. So let's try to wrap these up. Problem 18 is a MATLAB problem. So why don't you, let's separate that one out. Let's, uh, let's say do four and six to turn that in for the homework. And then problem 18 will be a MATLAB assignment. Um, that you can start working on. And we'll spend a little bit of time on Thursday when we're together talking about it more. I'll try to do an, start an example in that today. All right. So uh, let's, I know I'm a little late, but let's stick toward our schedule of trying to work on this homework this week, problems four and six. And it will, again, I think be uh, much more, you know, le less time consuming, at least in terms of practicing the stuff that we've just talked about this last week. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, do the last thing in my remarks, which is to review what we talked about last time. So here we are, now I'm doing a review. Here we are in Newton-Euler equations, equations of motion, EOM equations of motion. And our last lecture was to simply uh, do a derivation. Uh, I say simply a derivation. I think the derivation is insightful though, because it reminds us how these things work and gives us some insight. We do the derivation and then it's really just gonna be practiced from here on out. Let me point out the derivation. Newton's law, we knew well. As a matter of fact, I didn't even do the derivation for Newton's law. I started to, and then hem and hawed and stopped. So you just took my word for it. Here's Newton's law. At this point, we could go back and do that derivation pretty easily. We then set up and did the derivation for the moments. So we said the sum of moments over a body is a vector is just by definition a moment, an R cross an F. An R is a vector going from the point about which we're taking the moment. That would be D out to the particle. So Newton's law applies to any particle. So we looked at each, the body is made up of a infinites, uh, an infinite number of particles. Then we add, and that gave us a little infinitesimal moment. We added up those infinitesimal moments over the body to get the total moments acting on the body. And that required, we took this D, this R, uh, excuse me, the R was D to, to little particle P and F was the acceleration at P times dm. And we expanded all that out. Three of the terms were simple. They, well, actually four of the terms are pretty straightforward. Three of them canceled out. One of the terms gave us dg cross mass times acceleration of g. But the other two were the ones that took some effort. And through those other two, recall that we came up with this thing, which was this integral of this dm, which we called the mass, uh, excuse me, the inertia matrix times the angular accelerations. So I didn't, really write it out there, but this term ended up giving us the I alpha. That was the I alpha. And remember, that was I about the centroid, and then G happened to be written in body frame coordinates. So the whole thing is expressed in body frame coordinates. 
Then we went to the other term. We, we applied our math processes, kind of unwound and wound and unwound the problem a few times and got down to the same thing. We got down to this now omega cross I omega. We saw the, excuse me, yeah, omega cross I omega. We saw the omega I omega term and then we had an omega cross in front of it. So we pulled that all together. It gave us three terms for the sum of moments, the DG cross MAG plus the I alpha plus the omega cross I omega. Kind of sloppy with my little symbols. And that was our equation, our equations of motion for a rigid body. We had the Newton portion, F equals MA. We had the Euler portion, this total thing. We recall very importantly, the G is the center mass. We have to take this about the center mass. I has to be about the center mass. We have to be in body frame coordinates. That's a requirement or body, excuse me, body fixed coordinates. And then finally here, we're summing moments about some point D. We looked at a little, couple of cases. We looked at two special cases and the case frankly that I'll be using is when we just choose D to be G, the center of mass. And in that case, the new Euler's equations become M equals I alpha plus mega cross I mega. You can do the same thing for a fixed point. I tend to avoid it, just personal. I don't know why. I don't know why I shy away from that. I just do it the other way. And we expanded the equations out and we got uh, Euler's, equation, Euler's rotational equations here. In this case, we expanded out for a principal inertia matrix. And we got these straightforward three equations, which you can write in terms of solving for moments, or you can write them in terms of solving for the angular accelerations, which we're calling here the mega dots. And finally, I think this is where we wrapped up. We did a little bean counting. We saw that Newton gave us three second order differential equations. Euler gives us three first order differential equations. If we cast this in state space form, write them all in terms of first order differential equations. Newton would give us six first order differential equations. Euler would give us three first order differential equations for a total of nine first order differential equations. But we need 12, right? We need, we've got six degrees of freedom in space. And we live in the second order world in terms of dynamics. So we need three more. And they come from what I call my uh, Euler angle equations. This is only the name is goofy by me. Uh, Euler angle equations are standards. So I don't think there's anything special. And that's where we'll pick up now. Okay, that's done with remarks. So we're going to review Euler's angle equations. Uh, the previous we call Euler's rotational equations. And the whole goal here is to get three more, we're trying to get three more first order differential equations, right? And now these differential equations need to be effectively equations on like theta one dot equals something, you know, theta two dot equals something, right? That's what we need. Um, the problem recall was that we couldn't say that theta is the integral of omega. We can't do that. We can't integrate omega and get theta because omega is this non-polynomic vector. Or theta is not a vector. So omega is a special kind of vector and theta is not a vector. So, uh, okay, that's what we'll do now. The method is straightforward. Now I'm gonna follow, I'm following the notes in case you're there. I'm down to Euler's, the page that says Euler's angle equation. And, or diff, if I also say, or differential equations from Euler angles. And so here's the key. We're gonna write our Euler angle equations. This will give us, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna say this again. It'll give us three more differential equations that we need. That's one comment. And then the second comment is, that these are subject or these are specific to the Euler rotational rotation group or rotation set that you choose. So this is the only downside to what I'm about to do. Euler's rotational equations give us three first order differential equations on acceleration and they're universal. You can use whatever frame you want to describe. Of course, the, the 
you have to describe the equations in the body fixed frame, but you assign it however you want. Use whatever rotation group you want. Frankly, you could use rotation operators or the, you know, the equations would apply if you used a different method of describing rotation. When you go to Euler's angle equations, though, that's not the case. This is specific to an Euler rotation set. So the method is as follows. First, you know, choose your, choose your Euler set. And for this example, I'm going to choose uh, a 313 alpha, beta, gamma set. And those are the ones we saw before. So we note, noted, and I'll do this, this will not hurt for practice, we'll do this together again. What is that alpha, beta, gamma set? So I start out with a, a body fixed frame, so I'll call it like an N3, N1, N2, N3. I first have a rotation around the three frame by alpha, That gives me uh, this intermediate frame. I'll call it X prime, Y prime, Z prime. Then I rotate around the new X by beta. And that gives me an intermediate frame, which I'll call Y double prime, Z double prime. This is my X double prime here. Then I rotate one more time around the Z around the, the new three axis, which is the Z axis by gamma. And when I do that, I get a mess on my drawing. That gives me my X triple prime, which is now my body. I'm finally out to my body fixed frame. So that's my B1. Uh, somehow in this whole mess, I got a B2. You're not gonna see that in a B3. I don't know if you saw that or not. That was a mess. But again, we get first rotation around the three axis, the original three axis by alpha, then around the new one axis by beta, then around the new three axis by gamma. That gives us this green set, our body fixed frame B1, B2, B3. That's described relative to N. Remember, we described as a projection of the B frames on the N frame coordinates through that rotation operator, and that's what I need. Okay, drawing's a little bit of a mess. Maybe the one you just made is a little better, we can hope. Uh, we'll assume that. Um, please, at any point, stop me if you need a little more time clarifying that. And now we're ready to write out the set. So the set, recall, which projects B onto N was this Euler set. So it was, we post multiply. So at first it was a rotation around the three or the Z by alpha, post multiplied by a rotation around the one by beta, post multiplied by the rotation around the three by the gamma. That's our set. And that related these frames. If you will, as a little aside, this related frame, um, this guy related frame prime to N, this one related frame double prime to prime, this one related the triple prime or the B frame, the body fixed frame back to the double prime. And you can see kind of our, prom, our double primes will cancel, our single primes will cancel and see we get a projection B to N in there. And we have that and I will uh, write those down here in just a moment along the way. But here's the key idea now to the Euler set. Now let's describe the rotation the block, excuse me, the angular velocity of frame B relative to N. And we can see that that consists of those three rotations. So it is first, it's an alpha dot, of course, here, I'll just write it out this way. It's an alpha dot, it's a beta dot, and it's a gamma dot, right? However, the alpha dot occurs about the um, first axis, the Z axis of the three axis. And since I'm, I want to end up in the, I want to end up in the body fixed frame, I'm going to write it about the frame that's closest to the body fixed frame. So here I could choose, it's either about the N3 or the, excuse me, the N3 or the Z prime. And you know what, I realize I'm jumping between Zs and threes. So sorry about if that's creating confusion. I don't intend that to happen. But this is about the Z prime. 
The beta dot, let's look up here, you can kind of see in our rotation, the beta dot was around the X prime or the X double prime. X double prime is closer to the body fixed frame. So I'll just say it's about the X double dot, X double prime. And then finally the gamma dot is about, here's the gamma, so that's about the Z double prime or the B3 axis. So this one's about the B3. So you're probably getting some insight as to where these equations are gonna show up, right? I said I want an equation that looks like a theta dot or here an alpha beta, an alpha dot, a beta dot, or gamma dot equal to an omega. And you can see we're starting to get this. The only issue is I've got to write it all in a consistent B frame. So now I have to cast this all into the B frame. So let me go back up to our steps. Method one was to choose the Euler set. Step two was to write out the angular velocity. Step three is to write the angular velocity, and that is B to N in the body frame coordinates. So we're gonna do that now. So we got mega B to N, we get the alpha dot Z prime plus beta dot X double prime plus gamma dot B3. That one's already done. I need to project this one from the double prime coordinates back to, I've got to project this one from the double prime coordinates back to the B frame. And I've got to project this one from the, excuse me, I've got to project this one from the single prime coordinates to the B frame, this one from the double prime coordinates to the B frame. And then this one is already in the B frame. So let's start with this guy. I've got to project this guy, which is in the double prime coordinates back to the B frame. Well, look, right here, I've got a projection from the B to the double prime coordinates, right? So I need to pre-multiply by the, I need to pre-multiply by the transpose of the projection from the B to the double prime coordinates. Put that one right here. Okay, I'm gonna take the transpose of this thing. This projection will be from B to double prime. I wanna go from double prime to B, so I'll multiply pre-multiply by the transpose. Similarly, this guy is in the prime coordinates, so I need to pre-multiply by the projection. I've, I'm gonna easily have a projection from B to the single prime coordinates. I need to go the other way, so I'll take the transpose of that. So now let's write those down. This Projection from B to double prime was right here. This was the rotation around the three axis by gamma. Right, we saw from our drawing that that projected me from the B frame coordinates. Here I am in green from the B frame coordinates back to the double prime coordinates. So it's a rotation around the three by gamma or a Cos gamma, negative sine gamma, zero, sine gamma, cos gamma, zero, 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 one. This one projects me, this one is going to be a combination. This was the projection from B to prime. It's gonna be first a projection from the uh, double prime to the prime times a projection from the B to prime b to double prime, excuse me, those will cancel. And we saw up above when we wrote that down, this was the rotation around the one axis by beta, followed by a rotation around the three axis by gamma. The rotation on the three axis by gamma I just did, so I'll write it down again. It's cos gamma, negative sine gamma, zero, sine gamma, cos gamma, zero, 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 one. The rotation around the one axis by beta, it's one, zero, zero for the first row, first column also, because it's rotation around the one. And then I get cos beta, negative sine beta, sine beta, cos beta. Finally, I need to to multiply those two together, it gives me cos gamma, 
negative sine gamma zero because I'm just multiplying this first row times the whole thing. Second row, I get cos beta sine gamma, cos beta cos gamma, negative sine beta. Third row is sine beta sine gamma, sine beta cos gamma, and cos beta. So that's my projection from the B frame coordinates back to the prime coordinates. You know, to complete this rotation operator that we described above, I just have to pre-multiply one more time by this guy. But in this, in developing the Euler angle equations, I just don't need that part at the moment since I'm just going to B frame coordinates. Finally, I need to plug these back into my equation. So uh, I will rewrite this. So omega B to N is the transpose of the rotation from B to prime. So I'm gonna write that guy in here. I'm gonna write the transpose of this guy. Just take the transpose and put it in. So that gives me the first column is gonna be cos gamma, negative sine gamma, zero. Second column will be cos beta, sine gamma, cos beta, cos gamma, negative sine beta. Third column would be sine beta, sine gamma, sine beta, cos gamma, cos beta, times my alpha dot in the z prime direction. So that's zero in the x prime, zero in the y prime, and alpha dot in the z prime. Next term, I have to pre-multiply by the transpose of the rotation B onto the double frame coordinates, double prime coordinates. I had that one here, I need the transpose, so I'll write it in. Taking this guy, taking its transpose along the way, writing it in, so the first column is the first row from above. Cos gamma, negative sine gamma, zero. Sine gamma, cos gamma, zero, 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 one times now x in the double prime direction. So it's, oops, it's x component is beta dot, y component is zero dot, zero, z component is zero. And then finally I get gamma dot in the B frame coordinates. And it's in the B3, so zero, zero, gamma dot. Now at this point, these are all in B frame coordinates. Remember, this is the projection from, uh, this one is from, double prime a little message here let me peek at this real quick oh good i thought that was me now it looks like we're okay we're still recording all right i'm going to carry on this projects from the double prime back to the b no excuse me this projects from the single prime back to the b this is in the single prime coordinates this projects from the double prime back to the B. This is in the double prime coordinates. This is in the B, B coordinates. So look, these cancel the double, by my notation, the double primes cancel. This is in B. Single primes cancel. This is in B. So now I just have to write this last step. I have to multiply these together. So this alpha dot just gets, it's in the third column or third row here, which means it multiplies by the third column. So I get S beta, S gamma, alpha dot for the first term, S beta, cos gamma, alpha dot for the second term, and cos beta, alpha dot for the third term, plus beta dots in the first row, it gets multiplied by the first column, so I get cos gamma, beta dot, minus sine gamma, beta dot, zero. And then I get the last guy, the last one's easy, zero, zero, gamma dot. Now, let me write this one more time. So this is my, this is my angular velocity. So we'll write it out one more time. So it is S beta, S gamma, alpha dot, plus cos gamma, beta dot, first term, S beta, cos gamma, alpha dot, minus sine, gamma, beta dot, and then cos beta, alpha dot, plus gamma dot. I don't know if I'm saying these words right. I hope I am. Now I'm going to write, write that again. Always come up with new ways to write it. I'm going to write it as a matrix equation. So I'll put out the coefficient. So I'll get an alpha dot, beta dot, gamma dot. And my coefficients, I, I kind of had these terms already. 
being a little redundant, but the coefficients of alpha dot or S beta S gamma, kind of had them right here, S beta C gamma, and C beta, that's the first column. Coefficients of beta dot are cos gamma, negative sine gamma, zero, and then zero, zero, one. And then finally, what I'm after is a set of equations that writes theta dots, or here the alpha beta gamma dot in terms of the megas, my angular velocity, and I'll do that by, uh, let's call this thing uh, C, matrix C, so my alpha dot, beta dot, gamma dot is C inverse times my omega B to N, which was just omega one, omega two, omega three, in the B frame coordinates. And this is my, these are my three first order differential equations that I get from Euler's angles. So I call them, here I'm gonna call them Euler's angle equations. This, this completes the three that I need. I'm gonna let you write that, uh, finish writing that. I'll give you just a minute, finish writing down, catching up with me if I got ahead. What, drink a spot of tea? I do have class today, some youngsters. You guys okay back there? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to uh, our previous lecture. In the previous lecture, recall that we got three equations Omega dot equals this, omega, omega one dot equals this, omega two dot equals this, omega three dot. I'm gonna copy that actually. So from before, here we got uh, omega one dot, omega two dot, omega three dot. So this was three first order differential equations omega, and then here are three more plus, you know, an alpha dot equals a beta dot equals a gamma dot equals. So this is in a total, this is in total six first order differential equations that we need to solve. Okay, great. You're probably looking at that saying, ah, that's great, because he says it's great. What does that mean? Well, we will come back to talk about what this means. This, this is the equations we need to solve. Well, what am I gonna solve? We'll come back and talk about that. that. That's coming, that's coming. But at the moment we now have, let me just say this, this is the full set of equations needed to start writing our dynamics for any, you know, any rigid body in space. Okay, questions? Comments. All right, I'm gonna move on now to the next topic. The next topic was discuss the uh, inertia matrix. And Kevin, I'm jumping around a little bit in the notes that I had before. I think I had it spread around in a few other places. But let's talk about that now. So we have this thing called the inertia matrix. And we're, you know, this is not new to us. We're familiar with it. Uh, but I would like to take a few minutes and just remind us uh, about those things. We had it by definition, uh, you know, we, we had derived it, it came really out of Euler's, deriving Euler's rotation equations. And it gave us terms that we'll just expand out. It gave us terms I11, I22, I33 on the, on the diagonal. That's what I'm gonna call it at the moment. And then we get terms I row two, column one, I row three, column one, I row three, column two. And then up here, I row one, column two, I row one, column three, and I row two, column three. And conceptually, we're familiar with this, but M is our inertia, which is resistance to motion, right? Sam, what's inertia? Is that how you define it? Resistance to motion, you're gonna go with that? Okay, I then tells us how M is, it gives us a, it tells us how I, 
m is distributed. So it gives us a distribution on m. So it tells us how the mass is distributed. And now m is the inertia. Notice that m is independent of, it's really independent of uh, coordinate axes. It's just a scalar quantity. But i is dependent on the coordinate axes. Both the uh, origin, the location, as well as the, you know, the, the orientation of those coordinate axes. So you just have to recall that. You know, I guess that makes m or i not quite as global of a concept as m, but it's important to us when we think about dynamics. There are two parts, I'm gonna call them categories one and two. There are two parts of this guy. I don't know why I call it category one and two, but I do. Category one are things that we call the moments of inertia. And this is really what we've dealt with previously when we're talking 2D stuff. The moments of inertia are the I11, which we might call IXX, and it's given as the integral of Y squared plus Z squared dm i22, which is iyy squared, is the integral of z squared plus x squared dm, and so on, i33, which is izz. So we get these three. These are the diagonal. The second three we get, the next category that I, I will call the products of inertia. Oh, by the way, um, let me jump back. If you look at the moments of inertia, if you look at your table, you know, the table in your book, you get an IXX, an IYY, an IZZ. Usually we're looking at planar, you know, planar cases, or at least two D bodies. We assume one dimension is uniform, like thin disk, rectangular, regular rectangular, solid, and the like. And so a lot of times one of these terms will go away, right? So we get Y squared, DM, and the other dimensions contained. So you'll notice that this is the more general case. The products of inertia are the other three. So it's like uh, I12. And we'll notice that this thing has to be symmetric. So I12 equals I21, which is what I guess we could call our IXY. And that is the integral of XY dm. By the way, I'm integrating over the body. I13, which is I31, the thing is symmetric. This is telling us that I is symmetric. And that's a I, I guess I could call it YZ or ZY, is the integral of YZ dm, and so on. I23. Oops, I messed up. That's not YZ. That's XZ. And then I23, which is I32, which is I. Now I got YZ is the integral. YZ dm. These are the products of inertia. So with these two components, I can see that my inertia matrix is made up of these two parts. In the diagonal, I get the moments of inertia. And down here, I get the products. Oops. That's kind of the way the thing looks. Thing symmetric. We just said that. And it's got mass. Sam, what can you tell me about mass? Can mass be negative? No, exactly. So that means this thing is positive definite, or I guess it could go to zero. I always sometimes struggle with those definitions. So we'll say it's positive definite, it can never go negative. Maybe it's positive semi-definite, you know, assuming it go to zero. So I'm gonna throw the semi as an afterthought. You know, I guess it, it could go to zero. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's actually important uh, that we say that here. Conceptually, it's easy to say, well, mass can't go negative. Um, but that'll show up later on when we look at uh, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy I'm going to have is, you know, 
you know, we wrote it before as one half I theta dot squared. Well, now that we're writing it for a matrix, we're going to see it's going to be a mega uh, transpose I omega, or omega, if you will, omega cross I omega. Let me write it out like that. Well, mega transpose I omega is what I want to say, actually. And since I is positive definite, and omega you can see is squared, that's going to imply that for any non-zero, and here's where the, I get rid of the semi-definite, but for any non-zero omega, then this, this thing, which I'm going to call my kinetic energy, T is going to be positive, or, you know, positive, which makes it an energy, kinetic energy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the first concept I want to talk about. The second thing briefly I want to say is how do we get I? And we already mentioned this. And there's a number of ways we talked about already, but you can get it from your, uh, well, you can do it by derivation, which we don't do except in homework problems. We can do it from uh, tables in our books. Probably most realistic, we do it from CAD. Uh, you can do it experimentally. Typical shapes. Probably tables in CAD are the most common that you'll use. We'll get it somewhere. And then in the notes I actually listed, I, I grabbed a little bit from a table. There is this thing called the parallel axis theorem. We reviewed this once, I think we mentioned it once already, but the idea of the parallel axis theorem is that I can write the uh, I about any other point, let's call it D, and it'll be about a particular axis. So let's look at I about the XX axis, is I about the center. Oh, yes. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt oh. you. I had a question about the uh, kinetic energy term. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of there. Um, in the in the notes that are online, um, instead of omega, you have a v there. Yeah, yeah. That, is it is it supposed to be angular velocity or is it supposed to be just velocity? Uh, you know what? I was at this point. Um, yeah, I saw that when I was I was actually looking at this, trying to follow the same notes here, so I don't get off. Um, at this point, I'm just saying it's a velocity. With uh, it, it will be a it will be the angular velocity. So when we okay. write later on, when we write out T, the kinetic energy, I'll use T because that's what your book will use. And typically at this le typically we use T here for kinetic energy. It doesn't matter. We'll typically write it as one half mv squared, but v is going to be a vector, so it's going to be v transpose v plus one half i omega squared, and uh, we'll write that as omega t cross i omega. At this point, I wanted to confirm, I wanted to refer to this part. So I think this is probably a little better. If I had to redo those notes, I would go to the omega. I don't think it makes it wrong. I was just trying to indicate that you've got a velocity squared times I. This one, you know, this one, M is, as long as M is positive, non -z, you know, as long as M is positive, for any V I give, you know, this T is going to be positive. And then here I'm showing the same thing, but this is showing the extension of this idea that mass can't go negative. Now I'm saying it with a matrix. That's the idea of this positive definite or positive semi-definite. So it just verifies, I now know no matter what angular velocity I get, I'll never get a negative energy, which allows me to drive these energy. Okay, long-winded answer, omega or V is fine. I think omega is maybe a tad bit better. That's why I chose it this time. Okay, thank you. Good, please jump in at any time. Please do. Parallel axis theorem. So I about some general D is I about the centroid. So with parallel axis theorem, you, I'm gonna say we always need to work from the centroid plus MD squared. All right, now, uh, that one we already saw, and I'm on the next page here. 
the rotated axis theorem. This one's handy. Parallel axis theorem, we already know that's for translations. But wait, you ask, what about rotations? Well, that's where you use a rotation, rotated axis theorem. Now, you already know how to handle rotations, right? You say, ah, well, I want, let me mention this. So, um, okay, so let's say I've got I in my body fixed coordinate frames. And I want I about my fixed frame or another frame, okay? You know, and it can go whatever way. But just say you've got I in one frame and you want to write that I in another frame. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, you just use your uh, rotation operator. You could re-derive it, but that's a pain. So you'll just use your uh, rotation theorem. Now, here's the tricky thing, okay? You've got to do this thing that we call a similarity transform. We, this shows up all over in math. I'm trying to give you guys, I'm trying to help practice some math, which is probably one of my weaker spots. I'm trying to practice some math and introducing some concepts. So here in dynamics, we don't usually say that, but this is something called a similarity transform. And you'll see it a fair amount. I imagine you guys will be taking some finite element type classes down the road. We've got a number of those at the graduate level. And you'll see the similarity transform show up quite a bit. They, I want, I'm trying to use language so when you see this stuff again, it'll come right to you. So if I've got really any matrix, any, any property of a body described as a matrix, and I want to write it with respect to another frame, it shows up in finite element analysis because I've got these local elements and I want to combine them all in some global frame, well, I'm going to have to both translate these and rotate these. So uh, that's where it shows up. In this case, our, our property is the inertia matrix. So it sounds simple enough. Just pre-multiply by the rotation from B to N. That's a three by three. That's a three by three. It gives me a three by three. Everything seems fine. But that's not it. That's not quite it. That's not the complete... Uh, Similarity transform. You have to pre a post multiply by the inverse. So you undo and then you do. So this is the complete similarity transform, or what I'm going to call the rot rotation axis theorem, rotated axis theorem, much like the parallel axis theorem. All right. So you have to do these. You have to do these two steps. Um, here's how. You know, if, if you're trying to commit this one to memory, which I don't think there's any reason to commit this to memory other than to know here's where it is. Here's what I think. I've got some operation over here and I want to do this operation. And I know that I'm going to have to deal with something that's also an end frame coordinates, right? But the thing that I have is my IB. So this is what I have. So how do I do this operation? Well, first I've got to cast this guy from end frame coordinates back to B frame coordinates, right? So this is the projection from B to N. I've got to go the other way. So I put the transpose. Then I do the operation on this thing, right? Now I got to get it back into N frame coordinates. So I pre-multiply again. And then this part gives me the similarity transform. That's how I remember it. If that helps you take it. If not, here's the, uh, here's the equation. One other quick comment I've got to tell you. Remember, this is, uh, remember our discussion about the rotating world? This is specific to that. So the similarity transform is depends on how you write the rotations. We always rotate, write our rotations as going from body to fixed frame coordinates. If you wrote it the other way, then you'd have the transpose of that. So the other way some people write the similarity transform would be R and R transpose. And that would imply that here, here this R goes, think of this R as going from the N frame coordinates to the B frame coordinates sort of the transpose or the inverse of the one we do. Just take that with a grain of salt. Just keep, keep your eye open. Sometimes you see these defined in this way or this way, and it just depends on the context of how you're using the rotation. Hence, this is the whole reason, this is the whole reason why there's gotta be a better way to do this math. We just don't have it yet. Someday we'll have it, we'll throw away that stuff and come up with it. Okay, so far so good? You don't have to answer, only answer if you need to stop me. So now this brings us into a little insight here. So notice from the, uh, you know, the similarity transform of the rotated axis theorem, 
you know, I can go from an I described in one frame coordinate to I described in another coordinate frame, right? Well, when I do this, uh, this would be nice. This would be a good time to have a nice graphic to show this. And I don't have that. So I'm going to, uh, it'd be neat if I at some point came up a nice graphic to show up. But if you think about the inertias, I guess at this point, we're gonna have to do the lamest possible experiment, which is an experiment in your mind. Think about this uh, frame that's attached to a body. I don't even have a frame in a body. I got a coffee cup, tea cup. Okay, as I move my, as I move my frame around, I've got the frame, you know, this coordinate frame, this body fixed frame, right? And I said I had to be attached to the body, but I didn't say in what orientation, right? It could be attached like this or like this or like this or any possible way. Now for the thought experiment. Nick, do you want to try this thought experiment? Not really. It's not very good. I wouldn't. Okay, you're not going to. I don't blame you. Okay, so I've got my body fixed frame. I've got my coordinate frame here, and I got my body. As I slowly move this around, if you can imagine the values, the moments of inertia in these three directions are going to change magnitude, right? And then the values in the cross directions, the products of inertia, are going to change values, okay? So if you just agree that as I change the orientation of my body fixed frame relative to the body, the I terms are going to change. If you can just agree with that, hopefully that makes sense. Then think in your mind, is it possible there's a point at which the I X Y, the I X Z and the I Y Z go to zero. Is that possible? Well, they change. So it sounds reasonable. They could go to zero. So it is possible. So if, I can choose a body fixed frame such that IXY, IXZ, and IYZ go to zero. That means, of course, the IYX, IZX, and IZY go to zero. That means that my I now just looks like a head. That means that I only have the moments of inertia left. And I'm left with an I that looks just like this, just these diagonal terms and all these are zero, okay? That's a special case. So if I can choose a body fixed frame such that that happens, I get this. I call this my principal moments or my principal inertia matrix. It's actually my principal inertia matrix. And in this case, and I guess I should specify them, in this case, I11, I22, I33 are my principal moments of inertia. And, you know, whenever I write down principal or capital or other words that end in AL, I always wonder, am I spelling those the right way? I don't think I am actually. But hey, I'm not here for English. So I don't think that's right. I think, I think that's principal like a principal, a teacher in a school. I get confused. Do you know? You do know. Oh, he's your pal. Principal's your pal. Most of the time, okay. Mm. I'm gonna think on this one. I think it's an Ellie. Anyhow, those are the principal moments of inertia. Can I choose a, uh, a body fixed frame such that this happens? Yes, you can. So the answer is yes. And uh, so the answer is yes, I can. I always can. All right. And the fact that I do that, doesn't this eye look much nicer? So uh, it does. It's going to make our equations better. And frankly, it's going to also predicate some design of things like footballs. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Um, we'll bring something in and do our moment free dynamics on Thursday. So I can always define my eye uh, about a principal set of axes to give me principal moments of inertia or a principal inertia matrix. So now the question is how? And we saw the inside above. So I'm going to get, I want some I, some I about a new frame, and I'm going to call that IP. So that's a body fixed frame that's the principal coordinates. It's going to be some I general, some I general. It's about some 
body fixed frame is general. And of course, I'll have to do my similarity, similarity transport theorem. So I get my R from B to, well, that's a little goofy. It's from BG to BP. And over here, it's BG to BP. But this is the transpose. Okay, that's fine. So how do I get the R? This is the moment you guys were waiting for in this class. How would I get the R? My R, B to G, comes from the eigenvalue problem. I feel like I need to say dun, 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 right? Sam, every class you have once you get into college is going to have somewhere along the way, they're going to say, and we solve this using the eigenvalue problem. Such a wonderful thing, the eigenvalue problem. All the eigenvalue problem does is gives me principal directions. I mean, that's what it is. It deconstructs a matrix into its principal directions. In this case, it's, I can't think of a better example of the eigenvalue problem. I take a, I take a matrix and I want its principal uh, magnitudes and I want its principal directions. So I get, I, I do an eigenvalue problem. In this case, the R, the columns, of R, R, the uh, eigenvectors, and the uh, eigenvalues, the, or excuse me, the IPs, which is the I11, I22, I33, are the eigenvalues, the lambdas, the eigenvalues. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is just another case of the eigenvalue problem. So if I have a general I, I, I solve, I take the eigenvalue problem, the vectors, eigenvectors give me the columns, the magnitudes give me the principal components, and uh, I can use it that way. Now, with that said, I mean, this is very, this is very useful, uh, very useful, but typically we will actually solve it. A lot of times it's actually pretty straightforward if your body is re somewhat regular, like a spacecraft or a football or something. It's easy to get these principal directions from inspection. So it's not like you're going to be solving the eigenvalue problem all the time, but uh, it's quite convenient. And uh, you know, there are times if your, eye, if your body is not regular, you just use the eigenvalue problem to solve it. In general, these uh, principal directions are, uh, are the, these IPs, these principal components, Generally, describe the extremum. Describe the extremum. And I don't think that's a very good definition. But that is to say it gives you the I, you know, and depending on how you order them, you know, if you order them from smallest to lar largest, then I11 might be the smallest if you choose to do them that way. And then I33 would be the largest. So you can see a body that would look like, uh, you know, you can just see them. So like if I had a little, you know, a little rocket here, USA maybe, and I can see that I would get a very small inertia about this axis. This might be my I11, and then I would get here large ones around these axes. In this case, this one might have some symmetry internally or about two axes that might be similar. Okay, uh, and that's also very important because bodies with symmetry have very good properties under spin or have a better stability under spin. So if I can spin this thing around my principal directions, I can find stability in the system and uh, better than if I just spin it around arbitrary directions. And we will see, again, that's going to be our moment for your dynamics example. Okay. I think that's everything I'm going to say about I. There's some discussion in the book, lots of discussion online. I think this covers everything we need. Um, you know, if we think of more things, we'll bring that up. Okay. I'm at my halfway point, I'm going to uh, stop this record. Oops, I stopped the record. I'm going to stop the recording.